I think all of us would agree that the world and life would be much better if everyone could just use common sense. When we, when we fail to exercise common sense in just about any area of life, usually we end up regretting it sooner or later. Uh, you've probably heard this. There's a renowned scholar, a priest, and a little boy, and they're on an airplane that's about to crash. Three passengers, planes going down. There are three of them, but there are only two parachutes. So as the plane is about to crash, the renowned scholar says, uh, look, I'm the smartest person on this plane, so I deserve to survive this. So without any discussion, before anybody could say anything, he grabbed one of the parachutes and jumped out of the plane, leaving only one. So the priest and the little boy were left there. So the priest looked at the little boy and said, look, God has blessed me with a wonderful long life. Your life is still before you. You take the last parachute and save yourself. And the little boy said, that's okay. You can have the other parachute because the smartest man on the plane just jumped out with my book bag. <laughs> Y'all heard this? <laughs> common sense. When we fail to use common sense, sooner or later, we end up regretting it. In fact, some, we were talking about this this last week and a few of the guys on the staff came up with some pictures that illustrate what not using common sense might look like. Guys, bring up that first picture you guys found. It's a picture, okay. <laughs> now, if you can't make that out, this man is holding up a small fish in front of this crocodile. That is not a good idea. Common sense. Bring up the second one. Bring up the second one. Okay. All right, I saw this. I want to buy the refrigerator, but I don't have a truck to get it in at home in. That's okay. We can use the roof of my car. Not, something is not going to end well in this picture. All right, the third one's my favorite. Guys, bring up that last one. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's going to regret that idea. Common sense. The world and life would be so much better, so much more enjoyable, so much more abundant if we could just use common sense. But beyond common sense is something that I refer to as uncommon sense. Now, by definition, as you might expect, fewer people exercise uncommon sense than do common sense, because uncommon sense is less common than common sense. And yet, and there, there's, a, there's a good reason for that. I'll just, the reason that uncommon sense is less common than common sense is because it seems to make no sense. There are realities, there are truth about life that at first glance seem to be paradoxical. They seem to be contradictory. It's a, it's a statement that doesn't seem to make good sense. But here's what I want to suggest. If we can learn to exercise this uncommon sense I'm speaking about, life and the world would be much, much better. Now, if you're new to Redeemer, let me share with you what we believe about the Bible. Here at Redeemer, we believe that the Bible is, in fact, God's words to us about life and eternity. These, this book, the Bible, includes what God has to say about life and eternity. Now, here's what you find. When you read through the Bible, when you're reading what God has to say about life and eternity, you come across statements that are what I'm calling uncommon sense, statements that seem to be paradoxical, statements that seem to be nonsense. But before we write them off as nonsense or making no sense, since they are God's words to us, we are wise just to stop and figure out, okay, what is it that God is saying about life and eternity here? 
Remember what God said? He said, uh, he said these words. Uh, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what I'm saying is it makes sense to trust the uncommon sense statements that God has to say to us in the Bible. Now we're going to start this. We're going to start today with an uncommon sense statement that appears in red in your Bible. Now, you know what that means. That means not only is it in the Bible, but Jesus spoke these words. We're going to read Matthew's account. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record this exact same conversation. But Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to begin in verse 24. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's words in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now watch verse 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And he goes on. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they've done. You may be seated. Let me ask you, did the uncommon sense statement jump out at you? Let me reread verse 25. Now watch this. Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Let me, if I could just paraphrase what Jesus is saying, you find your life when you lose it for Jesus. You find your life when you lose it for Jesus. Now, on the surface, that makes no sense. For example, you would never say this. I'm going to find my keys by losing them. That doesn't make any sense. You don't, you don't, you don't find something by losing something. Losing something is not the way to find that same something. And yet Jesus says here, if you want to find your life, you must lose your life. So now before we just mark this up, just brush this off as nonsense, what is Jesus really saying here? Okay, there are two keys to understanding this statement of uncommon sense that can make all the difference in your life. Number one, key number one, here it is, you ready? The key to understanding what Jesus is saying is this, life lasts longer than most people think. Life lasts longer than most people think. One of the members of our church told me recently, I said, how are you doing? He said, well, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. I said, okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about living your expected lifespan. I'm talking about life lasts much longer than most people think. See, when Jesus talks about finding life, he is not talking about finding life as you and I have experienced life. He's talking about life in a very different way. Now, to understand this key, to understand this key, I want to make three what might appear to be silly observations about life, okay? Uh, Maybe these seem obvious to you, but they're important to what I'm getting at. First of all, truth number one, we've all experienced life. Everybody in this room has experienced life. Now, how do I know that? Because you're alive right now. You're experiencing life. Every single human being who has ever lived has experienced life. Now, what the reason I'm 
saying that is we all know what it is to live. Uh, we all know, for example, what it's like to grow because we're all growing. We all know what it's like to age because we're all aging. Uh, we all know what it is to set a goal and try to achieve that goal and the satisfaction that we feel when we meet that goal. We all understand what it is to have the joy of relationships with other people. We all know the heartbreak of broken relationships. All of us know something about, no, all of us know a lot about life because we've all experienced it. But now here's the second, maybe it's, maybe it's obvious to you, second observation about life. While we've all experienced life, None of us have experienced death. Now, most all of us have observed death, but none of us have lived through that event called death. None of us have passed through that door called death to the other side. Now, here's the third observation I'd like to make about life. <laughs> Every life Ends, it, ends in death. Death will be a part of every life. Now, we don't have to think about that. But listen, I'm just going to share this with you. You can't live without also dying unless the rapture happens before your death, which is what many of you are praying for, I know. Uh, death will be a part of every life. So what am I getting at? Here's what I want you to hear me say. Every life, Every one of your lives, every life consists of an event about which we have no firsthand knowledge. Your life necessarily includes an event sometime in the future about which you have no firsthand knowledge. So how do we live life under that cloud? There is something in my future that is inevitable and I have no firsthand experience about that event. How do I live my life under that cloud? Here's how. We live, we do what we always do when there's something we have to live with about which we have no firsthand knowledge. You know what we do? We make assumptions. We make assumptions. We make assumptions about what that event is going to be like. Now, I want to share with you the common sense assumption that many people, maybe even most people, many people make about death. Here it is. You ready? The common sense assumption about that event, event uh, that none of us have experienced, death is the end of life. That's the assumption we make. We, death must be the end of life. Now, to be fair, this is not an uninformed assumption because while none of us have experienced death, we have observed it. For example, we know what it is to go into a funeral home, for example, and see the, uh, the body of someone who has, who has passed away. And we observe that there is no life there. So that undergirds, that supports this assumption that most people make that death is the end of life. Now, that is a big deal. If you make that assumption, that assumption will change everything about the way you live life. How you see death has everything to do with how you view life. If death is the end of it all, that means that you're going to have less time left tomorrow than you have today. And that means today you have less time than you had yesterday. And life becomes this fleeting, depleting resource if death is the end of life. It's kind of like going to Disney. Not death, but <laughs> what I'm trying to say is a lot like Disney. If you've ever been to Disney, you know you don't go cheaply. Okay? Disney is an expensive place. In fact, I had a friend many years ago he told me, I go to Disney, I take my family to Disney once every seven years. I said, why once every seven years? Why not more frequently than that? He said, because it takes me that long to pay it off. <laughs> it takes me that. 
It's an expensive trip to go to Disney. All right, so here's what happens. Families invest a lot of money to spend seven days in Disney World. So the way that looks in reality is that parents, it doesn't matter how small their kids are, parents wake their kids up at the crack of dawn on that very first day. And they go into the park and they're waiting for the park to open when the gates open up. And they spend all day long in the park. They leave when the park closes. If, if little Johnny and Sally say, Mommy and Daddy, can we go back to the room for a nap? No, we're going to stay here and you're going to enjoy it whether you like it or not. That kind of thing. Why? Because it's important to get every single bit of enjoyment out of that limited time that you have purchased with your precious possessions. Time at Disney's limited, so you try to enjoy every single moment. Here's the way Paul said it about life. Here's the way Paul said it. If life ends in death, if death is the end of life, the way he said it was, if the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. See, if you buy into this assumption that so many buy into, that death, this thing you've not experienced, that if you assume that it's the end of life, that means you're going to do whatever you can to get the most enjoyment and pleasure you possibly can with every fleeting moment you have left. You will live for the here and now if the here and now is all there is. Now, most of you, if not all of you, know exactly where I'm going with this. It turns out that this common sense assumption about death turns out to be completely wrong. Completely wrong. In fact, when you read about what God has to say about life in eternity, you, he spends a lot of time talking about how death is not the end of life. I could point to many scriptures. I'll just share one. Acts 24, 15. There will be a resurrection. I'll come back to that. There will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. That's everybody. There's going to be a resurrection. Now, what do I mean? What does he mean by resurrection? This is important. There's a difference between someone rising from the dead and being resurrected from the dead. When Jesus was here, he raised many people from the dead, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, but they all died again. But when someone is resurrected, they never die again. Jesus was not just raised from the dead. He resurrected from the dead. That's why Jesus lives forevermore. So scripture teaches us that everyone is going to live forever. Death is not the end of life. Now, I want you to get your head around this next statement. Because it really pushes against this common sense assumption that so many make about death. Now, are you ready? Here it is. You will live longer after death than before death. Now, get your head around that one. You're going to, why is that? Because your life, let's say you really do well and you live to 120 years old. 120 years old. That'd be a long life, 120. And by comparison, eternity makes that 120 years such a small infinitesimal blip, you can hardly even notice it, you see. Let me just say something as an aside here. Uh, many people ask me, it's a tough question. Pastor Jeff, if God is a good God, uh, why is it that he allows bad things to happen to good people? Uh, why does God allow bad things to happen to innocent people? Okay, those are questions for which there is no human answer. No one is going to be able to understand the mind of God that way. However, one insight is this. When God looks at a person's life, their life here on earth is but a very brief introduction to life. 
life on this earth is but the very first phrase of a multi-volume story of a person's life. God has eternity to bring about our greatest good. God's, when God talks about life, he's not talking about just the 120 years you might live on earth. He's talking about your eternal life because he sees life differently. People live longer than most people think. So when Jesus talks about losing your life to find life, this life that we are able to find is not find is not temporary. Jesus is speaking about life throughout eternity. And he says, the way to find true life in eternity is to lose your life in the here and now. Which brings me to the second key for understanding this paradox. The second key is this. Losing your life means forfeiting control of your life in the here and now. Losing life in the original language really means to forfeit or turn over control to something or someone else in the here and now. Uh, for example, if you lose control of your car, that means you are no longer controlling your car. Something or someone else is controlling your car, forces or whatever. So when we lose our lives, that means we are yielding control of our lives to something or someone else. Now, what is the something or someone else that we lose our lives to that we turn control over to? Whoever loses their life for me will find it, Jesus says. So here's what, let me just summarize what Jesus is saying. If we want to find true life through eternity, we will learn to yield our lives in the here and now for Jesus and his program and purpose. That's what losing your life for Jesus means. It means turning control of your life over to Jesus' program and purpose. Now, let me talk to you about Jesus' program and purpose. Jesus' program and purpose is always in eternal terms, not temporal ones. Okay? So let me, let me just say what that means. When we lose our life to find it, we invest, in thing, we invest things that pass in things that last. That's what really, losing your life in the here and now to gain eternal life, true eternal life, losing your life here and now really means I'm investing things that pass in this temporary life in things that are gonna last forever. Think about death like a filter. That's the best way to think about it. Think of death as a filter through which you will pass. One day, you're all going to pass through this filter called death. You will, be able, you will pass through it. But that filter filters out those things that don't last. Temporal things, for example. If you invest your life in the here and now to the accumulation of wealth, for example, that's your sole goal in life. You pour your life into the accumulation of wealth. Guess what? That filter filters out every last cent when you pass through this filter. If you pour your life into achieving a certain position or a certain status or a certain amount of power, if you pour your life into that in the here and now, that is something that is going to be stripped away from you when you pass through this filter of death. If you commit yourself to perfecting a certain skill or a sport or whatever, at the very least, death is going to be that thing that keeps any of those temporary things from passing through to eternity. Death is like a filter. Now, here's the key. Here's the key to the whole thing, what Jesus is saying. If you lose your life for me, if you lose your life for me over here, you'll find it throughout eternity. What does that mean? There are some things in the here and now that you can invest your life in that last forever. There are some things, listen to me, there are some things that you can make your life about in the here and now that pass through death's filter with you. And you take them and their benefits throughout eternity 
with you. Let me share with you some examples of things that last forever. Okay, um, things that last forever. First of all, God's kingdom lasts forever. Uh, how do I know that? Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So what that means is if you invest your life in the here and now in this thing called God's kingdom, that goes with you through death's filter through into eternity. Here's something else that lasts forever. God's word lasts forever. For no word from God will ever fail. So that means if you invest your life in learning, understanding, applying, and living out what God's word has to say, there are benefits that follow you throughout eternity. Here's another thing that lasts forever. We've already spoken about it. People last forever. People last forever. There will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. That means if you invest your life in other people for the sake of eternal things, those things will follow you throughout eternity. What do we gather from this? Folks, listen. The best way to live is to lose our lives, turn control of our lives over to Jesus' program and purpose, which is all about building God's kingdom by living out his word and sharing his word into the lives of other people so they too can be part of God's kingdom, so that they too can know the joy of true life throughout eternity. Lose our lives now to find true life throughout eternity. I love, and you've heard this quote, but it is so powerful. Something to live life by. Jim Elliott said it this way. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to, in, to invest temporary things of life into those eternal things of life that not even death itself can strip away. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Here's the closing question for you. What is your life all about? What's your life all about? I like to think about the 100-year test. Whatever it is that you're committed to right now, what is that going to benefit you 100 years from now? What's it going to be worth 100 years from now? So, well, Pastor Jeff, that takes me a long way past 120. I'm not even going to be around in 100 years. Yes, you will be because death, whenever that may come for you, that is not the end of your life. Question, what are you doing right now to invest in 100 years from now and beyond? We are wise to plan for the long term. This journey, this eternal life, this investing our lives in Jesus' program and purpose begins as a distinct starting point. Every journey has a beginning. The beginning of this journey with Jesus is not when you're conceived. It's not when you're born. It's not when you go to church. The beginning, the, the beginning of this journey with Jesus is when you accept Jesus into your life as your Savior and Lord. He makes us alive in Christ when we come to Christ in faith. Let me ask you a question. Has your journey with Jesus started? Pastor Jeff, how can I do that? I would really like to know what true life is really all about. I would love to live my life with Jesus and experience eternal life. See, God loved, so loved the world that he gave Jesus that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, experience eternal death, but have everlasting life, true life throughout all eternity. But it all boils down to whether or not you believe in him. That's the starting point. The starting point of your journey with Jesus and mine is that moment when we say yes to him, when we accept him into our lives, accepting what he has done for us to rescue us from our own sin. The way I'd like to close this is I'd like to lead the entire room in a model prayer that you might use 
to get your journey with Jesus started. There's nothing magical about the words I'm going to say, but if God this morning is knocking at your heart's door and you pray a prayer like this in faith believing, true life will be yours. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Dear God, I have a sin problem. And I come to you right now for forgiveness. I believe Jesus was your son. and He came to die in my place. And then three days later, he was resurrected from the dead. And right now, I want you to know, I am placing all of my trust, not in what I can do, but in what Jesus did for me when he died for me. I trust him to rescue me from my own sin. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, as I commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was your heartfelt prayer this morning, here's what I'd like to ask of you. In just a few moments, we're going to dismiss our worship time. And back at guest services, we have prepared for all of those who accepted Jesus into their lives this morning. We've prepared a packet of information. We don't want you to leave here uninformed about that decision that you've made today. So it's free of charge. We just want you to have it. Go by. We're not going to pigeonhole you. We're not going to interview you. We're not going to ask you a bazillion questions. If you'll just go by guest services and ask for the literature that Pastor Jeff spoke about, they'll give it to you and you can be on your way. We've come to the point in our service we refer to as our response time. This is your chance to respond to God in whatever way he might be leading this morning. The altars are going to be open. You know, maybe your prayer of commitment today might be something like this. Dear God, I feel like I have allowed the noise of the temporary to distract me from the eternal. Can you help me to live life with my eyes focused on eternity? Can you help me, give me wisdom and discipline to live for the long term? Perhaps you have a need in your life and you'd like to come and ask God to intervene in your life. Or in the first service, we had people coming to intercede for other people. There's power in intercessory prayer. Our altars are open. I'll stand down here for a few moments. If you would like for me to pray with you or for you, I'm happy to. Let's all stand together. Let's all respond as God leads right now.